Prior to 1918, Russia was still using the Julian calendar. So on what is variously recorded, depending on the source, as either the 4th or the 16th of July 1887, Admiral Shestakov ordered work to start on a design for a third battleship for the Baltic fleet. Previously, they'd built two Imperator Alexander II class vessels, but they're just over 9,000 ton displacement for ships that were at this point designed purely to ensure Russian dominance in the Baltic rather than any particular ambitions beyond it, meant that it was felt that these vessels were really a bit too big. They'd grown somewhat during their design process. Shestakov was the main proponent of this, even though, ironically, the Imperator Alexander's increased displacement compared to the initial drafts was due in considerable measure to his own demands for alterations, almost all of which were increases. That being said, in November of 1887 the ship's design spec was released to the shipyards, and the preferred main gun battery at this point was the 9-inch gun, as it was believed that this would be capable of easily penetrating the armour of the existing German fleet, this being considered the most likely opponent at the expected battle ranges, which were, to be fair, pretty short. And as an added bonus, the 9-inch guns did not require complex hydraulic mountings. The secondary battery was to consist of 6-inch guns, as was standard for most battleships of the period, and the draft was to be limited to 22 feet due to the shallow nature of many key parts of the Baltic Sea. The only other requirement was that the ship had to be able to steam from Kronstadt to Munsund and back on its internal coal a one-way distance of about 220 nautical miles, and it needed to do this at between 14 and 15 knots, obviously without needing to refuel. Now, although she was primarily required for operations in the Baltic, this new vessel was also theoretically to be able to operate in the Mediterranean, and even possibly to steam to Far Eastern waters. In general configuration, the new vessel, which would be named Gangut, was a fairly close follower of the pattern of design set by the Imperator Alexander II class. The hull had 14 transverse watertight bulkheads and a double bottom that extended from frame 20 to frame 69. The prominent ram bow was reinforced by the protective deck, and amongst some of the other distinctive features there were some particularly tall davits for her boats. There was also a fairly prominent stern walk inset in the hull if you're looking at the ship's stern, which was a somewhat reduced version of the elaborate stern walk that could be found on Imperator Nikolai I. That's the ship, not the Tsar. Of course, changes were made, and in the end, the main armament actually comprised a single 12-inch gun in a covered barbette mounting at the bow. The secondary armament included four of the single 9-inch guns in casements, and a tertiary battery of four 6-inch guns was found in open mounts. Anti-torpedo boat armament was provided by six 47mm guns and 12 37mm guns, both made by Hotchkiss. There were also four 63mm landing guns and six torpedo tubes, one fore, one aft, and two per side above the waterline in hull mountings. As it became obvious that she'd come in overweight, the Russian Navy considered replacing her 12-inch gun with a fifth 9-inch gun in order to reduce that weight, Alternatively, they also considered replacing the entire 9-inch battery with new 6-inch Canet guns, which would give her a total of 8 6-inch weapons, and leave the 12-inch as the sole piece of heavy artillery. But neither of these options were actually taken up. Armour consisted of compound armour with a main belt 16 inches thick at its maximum, but more than half of it ended up below the waterline in typical conditions, thanks to completing 600 tons overweight. The 12-inch gun barbette had 9 inches of protection at its thickest point, and the 9-inch guns had 5 inches of armour on their casements. By the time she was launched, newer, lighter, and stronger Harvey steel armour was available, and some thought was given to giving the ship equivalent protection, but using a thinner amount of metal, which might salvage some of the excess weight, but this consideration was ultimately dismissed as being too expensive to carry out, and would require the ship to spend more time in dock at a time when the Russian shipbuilding industry was under a huge amount of pressure to supply new ships to the Navy. As a result, Gangut ended up being capable of just under 14 knots compared to her design speed of 15, 
this speed being supplied by f two screws using vertical triple expansion engines that put out 6,000 horsepower normally and could increase that by just over 50% when under forced draft. The ship's overweight condition thus remained and began to become a genuine concern to the point that many realised it was jeopardising the ship's actual survivability. Although the increase was only 600 tonnes, which doesn't sound like too much, compared to the design displacement of 6,500 tonnes, it's the equivalent of stacking two full-sized interwar destroyers on the deck of a treaty battleship and expecting things to go well. She was laid down at the end of October 1888, launched in July 1893 and commissioned the following year. Even with a number of measures in place to reduce the ship's weight, no one was especially happy with her and in her third year of service they were vindicated as on the 12th or potentially 24th of June 1897, remember that calendar difference, a very slight shock was felt as she sailed near Viborg and the ship suddenly veered two degrees off of course. The stokers reported that they'd heard the bottom scraping a rock, which was indeed the case, an uncharted rock, fortunately for the captain, and moments later the ship was beginning to flood, somewhat less fortunately for the captain. The flooding entering directly into the starboard forward boiler room despite all the doors and hatches being secured thanks to poor quality control in the construction of her bulkheads. The ship sank slowly on an even keel, but slipped below the surface later in the day. Fortunately, thanks to this rather stately descent, no lives were lost. The drawbacks in her design meant that with limited reserve stability, the counter-flooding that the crew attempted before having to abandon ship had essentially no effect on anything other than just accelerating her demise because now there was more water in the hull. A plan to refloat the ship with the uh, Swedish Neptune company ended up not being carried out due to the Russian Admiralty feeling that the ship was already obsolete and would need extensive work in the dockyard not just to repair her but to make sure it didn't happen again and so the wreck remains at the bottom of the Baltic to this day. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.